So it's a real pleasure for me to speak at this meeting in honor of the 60th birthday of Simon Donaldson, who's one of the truly great mathematicians of our time. Um, I missed most of the meeting, unfortunately, because I had to teach, but I understand it's been a terrific meeting, and so I think we should thank the organizers. <laughs> so, yeah, I want to talk about non-collapsed gromov hausdorff limit spaces with a lower bound on Ricci curvature. So, there they are, and two is the non-collapsing condition, and we want to discuss some new structural results on what these spaces, these limit spaces look like, and it's joint work with Aaron Neighbor and Wen Chui Zhang. So, here's the main theorem, which is that such a space has a decomposition into what a think of as the epsilon singular part, um, which is closed, and the new information about it is that it's actually rectifiable, um, and the volume of a tubular neighborhood is bounded by a constant times r squared, and this implies, of course, that the n minus two-dimensional Hausdorff measure has a definite a priori bound in terms of uh, the dimension, the lower bound on volume, the Ricci lower bound has been normalized, and we'll s maybe see what a second, what epsilon is in a, in a second. I have to chop off the very flat part. So the complement um, is uh, by holder to a smooth manifold, and more and more so uh, if you chop off less and less of the singular set. Uh, so the, the new part is really three and four. Um, so just to be clear, rectifiability in this case, um, I mean the set is rectifiable if you can up to a set of measure zero, so I'm taking rectifiable to mean with respect to Hausdorff k-dimensional measure, and then if you can write it as a countable union of measurable subsets, each of which is um, by Lipschitz to a positive measure subset of Rk. So that's what it means. So it's a little bit like being a manifold only measure theoretically, and of course, actually in this context, as we'll see on the next slide, it need not be a manifold. So here's a very good, uh, well-known example to keep in mind. So I want to consider a convex uh, surface, so it's the boundary I could take it of a polyhedron, and the polyhedron or I consider a sequence of such where I start maybe with a simplex, then I erect on each face another simplex with small altitude, maybe which goes down to the Barry Center, let's, let's imagine. And then I keep doing this. Um, now the edges, intrinsically, it's smooth, so really I just have corners, and if I make the, what I put on flatter and flatter, uh, then the corners never become really flat even in the limit, and I wind up with a surface. The corners can easily be rounded, so it is a limit space actually with um, non-negative curvature in this case since it's a two-dimensional surface, but the singular points are dense. It's a accountable dense set the way I constructed them. So the singular set, in other words, with uh, a lower bound on Ricci is not a closed set, uh, but uh, a definite piece of it is closed, and if you throw away the infinitely many uh, points that are left in this case, you get this R epsilon of the previous transparency, which, or, or slide, which um, 
is a manifold, uh, at least uh, the metric is by Herder to a, a smooth Riemannian metric. So uh, it will be difficult to really describe the proof of this, which is very technical. Um, but uh, what I want to do mostly, apart from some remarks at the end or indications at the end, is to put it in uh, context, uh, what was known, um, where did the ideas come from, and what new ideas are needed, at least a little bit, describe that. Okay, so um, in the work with Colding, we showed that the Hausdorff dimension of this S epsilon is uh, at most two. Uh, dimension always means Hausdorff dimension. And we, we used, even though we weren't really too familiar with it at the time, what was the classical methodology uh, of the Georgie Federer, Fleming, and Almgren, which was developed mostly in the context of minimal varieties uh, in the probably 50s and, and, and 60s, um, and later used harmonic maps by Shane and Uhlenbeck. Uh, and, but its use in Riemannian geometry definitely required uh, some new techniques, the implementation of this methodology. And the point is that one can look at the, the singular set so for us, this, the whole singular set is just a set of points um, with the property that the tangent cone, which will appear shortly, is not Rn. If it's Rn, it's unique. And now, so what's a tangent cone? So by Gromov compactness, if I have a limit space with Ricci bounded below, might even be collapsed, um, I can look at its infinitesimal structure, that's the first thing you would like to understand if you want to ask how does, how much could it, what could it look like, how much could it differ from being a manifold, say, at the infinitesimal level. So you can blow it up and by Gromov's compactness theorem take uh, a converging subsequence for any blow up sequence and if you're in a smooth Riemannian manifold that would just give you the tangent space with its usual metric and in general, you can do this if it's a limit space with Ricci bounded below, but the non-collapsing assumption, as we'll explain uh, soon, says that what you get when you do this is a metric cone. Um, and then the filtration uh, is that something is an SK if no tangent cone, even if it's non-unique, splits isometrically off a Euclidean factor of dimension k plus one. Now, so the point of this filtration maybe um, was the Hausdorff dimension inequality. So this had analogs in these other contexts, uh, minimal surfaces and then later harmonic maps, and the point was that the worst singular points, those that, that were tangent cones don't split off anything, uh, there should be the fewest of those, and the more bigger Euclidean factor splits off, the more regular it is. And then we have this uh, Hausdorff dimension inequality, which um, we proved in our context, it required different methodology, uh, as I mentioned, that the dimension of SK, the case, it's, it's usually called a stratification. I would rather call it a filtration. Um, and the dimension of SK is less than K. So if you haven't seen this, you could think of a simplicial complex with a triangulation, and then the K skeleton has uh, dimension uh, k and splits off a Euclidean factor when you blow it up in the simplex direction. And in the normal direction, it's the cone on the link. So classically, this was proved, and in our work with Colding, it was proved by um, iterated blow up arguments, also known as dimension reduction. And to remind you these, if you haven't seen it, then I'm 
not to remind you, these are arguments by contradiction. Uh, the idea being that if the conclusion fails, in this case the conclusion is this inequality, um, it should fail um, for the blown up space, and this is a density argument just using properties of Hausdorff measure if I blow up at a generic point. Um, now, the point is that this will be helpful, this blow up argument, where if tangent cones are, are somehow better behaved than X itself was. And in, if Ricci is just bounded below, they're not well enough behaved to implement this immediately. But when uh, you're in the non collapse case, um, actually tangent cones have a very special structure. Um, they exhibit the Riemannian version of radial invariance, which is the typical um, structure that's useful in other problems in geometric analysis. So they're cones, and in this case they're actually metric cones, which means they actually, uh, the metric in polar coordinates on this thing, which is R plus, topologically R plus times a certain cross section, um, looks like in polar coordinates, R is distance from the vertex of this cone, uh, and Y is some cross section, which is a length space of diameter at most pi, and now actually is known to have Ricci curvature bigger than that of the sphere in a precise synthetic sense. The metric just looks like the law of cosines in Euclidean space. That's what a metric cone is. Um, so, okay, in particular, this has the consequence, this radial invariance, which is the typical key point, that every point except the vertex lies on a ray. And now, if we blow up again, then this ray will become a line, and in fact, the cone, the blown up cone, or a blown up limit, uh, if I blow up at a point other than the vertex, which is almost every point, will now split off the line isometrically. So blowing up again improves it further. And after k plus one blow ups at generic points, so the vertices, notice in R cross the, um, the cone on this Z1, anything across the vertex of Z1 is now a vertex in that cone. Um, so I don't blow up at those points, but there's still plenty of points left uh, since that's just an R of points. And after K plus 1 blow ups, every tangent cone now uh, splits off K plus 1. So this thing SK, which was defined um, that it didn't have any tangent cones, um, that split off our k plus 1, uh, now I get a contradiction because on the one hand it had to be non-zero by this density argument. Each time I blew up it preserved the idea of being non-zero, but on the other hand now everything will split off our k plus 1, so that's the contradiction. So that's the methodology. Now next let's examine why our tangent cones metric cones. So this formally the same as in the classical kind of argument, but it had to be implemented correctly in this context. So now, why are they, well, okay, so there's a crucial function, which is the volume ratio. Um, actually, in applications like what are done in the paper, it's convenient to use something else which is a kind of entropy, but this is the easiest to understand, and you could use this one. This is the familiar one. So this... Not the volume ratio, so the... the oh, what's in the, what's in the denominator should have uh, a bar under it, and P, P underline is in the model space. Uh, thanks. Um, just like the, the ball up there. Um, okay, so... So this ratio by Bishop Gromov is monotone, actually decreasing as a function of R. Uh, it's a priori bounded, which comes from your non-collapsing assumption. So it starts out, at most it's one, and it's bounded below because you assume a definite amount of non-collapsing. And it's, I'm, I, I use the term coercive, which I'll explain, 
it, there's an almost rigidity theorem is another way of saying it. Anyway, I'll explain momentarily what coercive means. So monotonicity, as I said, is just the bishop gromov inequality. The boundedness just comes from the non-collapsing assumption. And so it's pinched, right? It's at most one, and if I go out, let's say, r equals one, um, it's bounded below by the uh, obvious thing from the non-collapsing assumption. Okay, now here's what coercivity means in this case. So it refers to the almost equality case of Bishop Gromo. So it's kind of known that if you're in the equality case, well, formally it would actually have to be Rn, uh, but you can make a version with areas of boundaries where you would say it looks like an annulus in a cone if this monotone ratio doesn't change at all. The thing that's monotone means weakly monotone. If it doesn't change at all, you're in a rigid case. So, but the stronger and more useful statement is what happens if you're almost in the rigid case. So that's what's in this theorem here. So I go in a bit so it makes sense. And then if you have some value of R where over this interval here, the thing that's on the inside is bigger, uh, it should be a script V, I now see. Uh, all right, so that's a script V. Um, and then if it hardly changes at all, then the claim is that you're very close to, in the Gromov house, a ball in some cone. Y star is always the vertex of the cone C of Y. So in words, this says almost volume cones are almost metric cones. It's an example of what I call almost rigidity, what we called it in our paper with Toby, or uh, coercivity is another term for it that I like to use in this context. So then uh, what could we conclude from that? Just formally, it's kind of interesting to me, I realized afterwards, that people might have believed this without seriously trying to prove it. The equality case is basically something you can prove with ODE and following each line of a string of inequalities and seeing that they all must be equalities in the usual way. But the almost uh, rigid case really Im involved new ideas to prove it. And on the other hand, it's kind of funny in retrospect that people just didn't assume it and examine uh, what that would have told you. Of course, probably people could have guessed it. So what it means, so let's just make the convention that a scale is two, 2 to the minus j, and let's fix a point and examine balls on all of these different scales. Well, since this volume ratio is monotone and a priori bounded because of the non-collapsing, when I go from one scale to the next, uh, or delta scales, or two delta scales, whatever, most of the time it's not going to change at all because it's monotone and, and pinched and there are infinitely many scales. So therefore, on all but a definite number of scales, say an epsilon, I'll be epsilon close on its own scale to being a ball in a cone. So. Uh, so you could have just kind of guessed that the, that the almost rigid version was true and then followed your nose what it would tell you, but I don't think that that was really done, particularly for whatever reason. So in particular, this has the immediate consequence that tangent cones are metric cones. Now, if we think about the reasoning, <sighs> The argument was on the smooth manifold, but because the estimate was effective, we could pass it to the tangent cones. We didn't do the synthetic uh, argument on the tangent cones themselves. So if you think of what happened here, we had, on the one hand, an effective estimate. For every epsilon, there was a definite number of bad scales with respect to that epsilon, and on the rest, 
your epsilon close to being a cone on your own scale. But the conclusion, as it was stated, was just about tangent cones, or Hausdorff dimension, which are infinitesimal con con concepts in, in, in a way. So um, this is worth bearing in mind, and there it stood for a while. And similarly, classically in these other areas like minimal surfaces, there were statements about tangent cones and Hausdorff dimension, and in some rare cases, rectifiability of singular sets, very special. But mostly, it was about the Hausdorff uh, co-dimension of the singular set. So we'll see shortly where such statements came from. But I want to emphasize this point here, that on the one hand, you had effective estimates, and on the other hand, you were using them to pass them to the limit space and then say something about the infinitesimal structure. So, um, okay, we'll come back to this point. Um, okay, so similarly, there's a version of the splitting theorem with uh, a similar effective version and then the conclusion that it passes to limit spaces with uh, Ricci non-negative in uh, the appropriate limiting sense, lower bound going to zero, which tangent cones would satisfy. Um, okay. So now, um, this was used actually to conclude the singular set has co-dimension two, and the way you did this was another part of the methodology. So what you do is once you know that a tangent cone is uh, exhibits radial invariance, in this case is a metric cone, then uh, you can ask what are the possibilities? Um, and if you want to show that the singular set uh, has a definite co-dimension, what you have to show is that the possibilities that split off a large Euclidean factor actually don't occur. So they're perfectly good cones, but maybe they aren't limit cones. And indeed, the most famous classical case of this strategy is probably what Jim did, um, showing that the singularities of minimal hypersurfaces uh, are uh, co-dimension seven, right, by showing that the candidate minimal cones were unstable. So here, you uh, have to show if you think about it, what's, what could a metric cone be? Uh, the cross-section has to be connected by the splitting theorem. So what could it be if it splits off Rn minus 1? It's either Rn minus 1 times R, in which case it's not singular, or um, it's times R plus. Those are the only possibilities. So then it's a half space. Now a half space has a boundary, and the boundary is, is kind of occurring inside of the ball. So that kind of looks wrong. If you take a ball, it has its regular boundary, but the half space is also a boundary, and it's inside the ball, where it's a limit of things that don't have boundaries inside. And by making that precise, you can see that it can't occur. Uh, so this is the general strategy. Um, now, some of the techniques, so as I said, this needed new techniques to implement this methodology in this uh, new Riemannian situation, and some of them, and a key idea was, since there's no equation here, only an inequality, to regularize distance functions, which are the natural, dis which are the natural functions in Riemannian geometry by approximating them by solutions to equations and showing that in this almost rigid situation, the approximations are very good, usually to begin with in an integral sense, and then, uh, so that's what I'm calling all of one up here, and then the idea is for turning the integral estimates on the solutions to the actual equations into the corresponding estimates on the original distance functions. So th the, the advantage when you regularize, of course, so regularizing might be t looking at a ball and taking the appropriate solution with the same boundary values. So. It could be either a distance function, then 
the equation would be what it is on a cone, in particular in Euclidean space, the Laplacian of R squared is 2n. So that's the Poisson equation. Or if you wanted a coordinate function um, over here, then you would, you could, it, in Rn, or if it splits off, it will satisfy these two properties. So then you might want to take something with these two properties, like this one in particular, and uh, the same boundary values, and then measure how close it was to what you would like it to be if you're almost geometrically in that situation. So that's the kind of technique, and the advantage was that when you take uh, the solution to the elliptic equation, then you get estimates on the derivative. So it's a, specific, it's a particular kind of regularization. Um, and you can use both Bachner's formula to control the norm of the Hessian and the Cheng Yao gradient estimate uh, to control the gradient pointwise. Um, and uh, okay, so those were some of the techniques, the new techniques that were used to implement it in this Riemannian context, the sort of classical methodology. Um, where in those cases you actually had an equation, in fact a variational principle, so that's where your monotone quantity came from. Um, so it might be the area or uh, the volume ratio, let's say, in the minimal surfaces case, or a energy density in harmonic map case. Um, okay, but in both of those cases you had a variational principle and an equation. Um, now, here the analog of the equation would be a two-sided Ricci bound, or it could be actually instead of an inequality, an equality. Uh, so you have more regularity, of course, it's, if it's an equality, but much fewer examples. So you don't pay very much for the inequality, it's just on the regular part, it's slightly less regular, C1 alpha, whereas otherwise it would be, the metric would be C infinity in a quantitative sense that will be coming. Um, so um, then, in fact, with the two-sided bound, it was conjectured, I think, originally by Mike Anderson um, in 1993 that the singular set should be co-dimension four. The, we proved this, I think it was mentioned maybe uh, indirectly in uh, Gabor's talk. Uh, in the Kähler case, which is much easier. Uh, in the real case, uh, uh, this was not easy to prove. Uh, this was joint work with Aaron, neighbor. And what was realized was that in this case, the cone you had to, suppose you wanted to show it had co-dimension three. The only cone you would, now you know it, the Sn minus one with S n minus 2 deleted, that was empty by what we said before. Now you have to go from 2 to 3, and the only candidate cone is this one. And of course, this could arise. Um, I think this, this should be the cone on this circle, so that's another typo. Uh, so it should be C of S1 beta that's there. Um, but uh, if you had just a lower bound, this would be a two-dimensional paper cup cone, and of course it could arise, but uh, the conjecture was it couldn't arise with just Ricci two-sided bound going to zero, and this was not easy to prove. It was open for a long time and eventually managed to prove it first quite a bit earlier in the early 2000s, Tian and I separately proved it uh, in the Kaler case where it's much easier. It was similar to what was in a paper of ours with Toby um, and just was noticing that a similar argument applied. Now, I come back to a point I mentioned earlier about effective estimates only being used to make conclusions on an infinitesimal scale. And uh, so now, I want to talk about a break with tradition that first came in a paper with Aaron in 2012, where we understood or realized that you could actually say something about the behavior on a fixed scale, and not just on the infinitesimal scale. And 
So let's, uh, it's easiest to talk about it maybe in the Einstein case, especially for what I'm calling Theorem 5. Um, so first, on the one hand, in the paper in 2012, we showed that you could prove effective estimates. Now, effective means instead of Hausdorff measure, or d rather dimension estimates, so the Hausdorff dimension, dimen dimension you consider covers by balls of your set, by balls of arbitrarily small radius, and you don't demand that the radius is the same for all the balls, so that helps you to cover it. But here, the volume of a tube, the tube has a definite finite radius, and uh, if you want to think of it as a union of balls, they all have the same radius. So this is a more effective statement. And this estimate, which we showed, was almost what you would expect if it were just a compact submanifold of co-dimension four. So the sticking point was this. We had to um, have this constant in the exponent, which and a constant in front. Yeah, is there another mistake, Claude? Side of Ricci bound and the Einstein condition, which would be well, well, the Einstein condition has a constant in it. So I mean, that's I want to normalize the constant. That's that's what I mean. So the, this 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 part would be just as good without the Einstein Einstein condition. Actually, it's only what I want to say about this. This would be C one alpha or something instead of sectional curvature, otherwise it works exactly the same. So I just mean the normalization or the Einstein constant. So, um, so on the one hand, not only, on the one hand you can say uh, the volume of the points around the singular set, there's just this annoying thing here that it's not quite what you would like it to be, but almost. But a crucial thing, especially in the Einstein case, which was, I mean, you could have said S epsilon and 2 minus eta uh, if you want to just lower bound. This we also showed. But I want to emphasize this point over here, that on the one hand, you control the volume of a tube of a definite size. And on the other hand, outside of the tube, you have a definite amount of regularity in this sense. And it's crucial that it's on the whole ball. Okay, It's crucial that it's on the whole ball. So what does this say? This is sort of scale invariant. If it says if you rescale it to unit size, then it's only blowing up quite slowly. And because on the whole ball, you have elliptic regularity. So for example, you would have estimates on the covariant derivatives or on, in, in the Einstein case as well. You get estimates on harmonic functions by this methodology uh, and on higher derivatives thereof in the corresponding cases. So, uh, so I'll get to that momentarily. So what did I do here? OK. Yeah. So, yeah, so I want to emphasize these two points. On the one hand, you have an estimate for the volume of tubes. On the other hand, you know that it has a definite amount of regularity outside the tube. So this turned out had been sort of overlooked, that is, was applicable to all these other cases, which had now been treated in the old methodologies, uh, so minimal surfaces, harmonic maps, mean curvature, flow, et cetera. And these were worked out partly jointly with Robert Hasselhofer and Daniele Valtorta. So in particular, because of this regularity outside in the harmonic map case, uh, just to give an example, you could see that the gradient was in LP for any P less than 3. And actually, it was known it wasn't in L3. And b I mean, an example showed it needn't be in L3 even for a minimizing map, a map from the ball to the two-sphere, so it's not continuous at the center, it's just radial projection. Um, so that's an example of taking advantage of this definite amount of regularity away from the singular set together with ellipticity. Um, so I stated it as 
an LP estimate because that's a more classical statement, but the actual estimate is on the inverse of the regularity scale uh, as defined on the previous transparency. And uh, that's, of course, much, much stronger. The LP estimate is just more traditional, but it's a corollary. Um, now, here is what I believe happened, um, why these estimates, estimates of this type weren't proved sooner. So there's a principle, which was really the principle involving the three quantity, the, th the three characteristics of the monotone function that on the previous slide, namely it's um, monotone, in that case decreasing, traditionally in these other cases they define it so it's increasing, it doesn't matter. It's a priori bounded, so that would be like an energy bound or, or volume bound in these other cases, and uh, it's coercive, meaning that if over a, a number of scales it hardly changes at all, it's almost constant, which would be true most of the time for the same formal reason, then you're very near this model radially invariant uh, situation in a stronger sense. So if you're near it in a weaker sense, you're near it in a stronger sense. So uh, I kind of, we, we axiomatized this in a paper on a very different subject, but it happened, I was enticed into studying Lipschitz maps to L1 by Asaf Noor, and eventually we wrote a paper about them, so it looks like a totally different thing, maps from spaces, in this case the interesting example was the Heisenberg group, into this infinite dimensional space, L1, which has the property, which I didn't totally realize at the time, that unlike little L1, um, it's, it's not uh, a dual space, um, it's separable but not a dual space, and uh, maps are not as constrained as to some other LP and you needed to develop a new theory, but the point was this quantitative differentiation idea could be implemented in that context. So it was just kind of a coincidence that Asaf brought me this problem and eventually I realized that really because of what I was doing with metric measure spaces, but then because I'd also thought about Ricci curvature, I realized there was a carryover. So the quantitative uh, differentiation idea had appeared in different guises. Work of Doran Soro was one of the earliest, Peter Jones, David and Sems on uniform rectifiability, and Ribe, where it was actually in a Banach space context, but uh, because these were I don't want to say arcane, but a somewhat specialized con uh, context, the simplest instance of this idea was not generally known. Almost no analyst has ever thought about the simplest instance of this quantitative differentiation idea, which is, in my opinion, if you look at a function on zero, one, real valued, and you assume only its derivative is bounded in absolute in norm by one, it's derivative. You don't assume anything about the second derivative. And then you look at it on all locations and scales and ask how often is it epsilon close to being linear, suitably rescaled picture. There are infinitely many locations and scales, countably many, but it turns out for any epsilon it only differs by a finite amount. And that's something you can teach to an undergraduate, actually, but almost no analyst has thought about this or heard of it. And if that had been the case, in my opinion, uh, this stuff could have been done sooner. So really, the fact that you had effective estimates and you only used them to prove infinitesimal results, I think, was a historical accident because when this principle arose, it arose in specialized contexts and most people didn't know about it. You can literally teach the simplest and most basic in instance to undergraduates and I might even argue that you should do that. So the general applicability of this point was missed. So in order to implement the results we had with Aaron, you needed some technical uh, ideas, one of which was the quad quantitative stratification, which is something a little bit a refinement of this S epsilon that I wrote. Um, so I'll say in a second what it is. A, 
an effective version of cone splitting, I'll say what that is. Energy decomposition, I'll say what that is. And a certain covering argument, well, it's a covering argument. And uh, some novel regular, uh, epsilon regularity theorems, which actually are rather soft. So, all right, let me try to explain what these things are. So, um, let's make an effective version of this filtration that I had before where we pick an R and we say, if I look at all scales, so I say it's in epsilon R, if on all scales between 1 and R, so R is the first effective part, and this looks like what I had before, uh, it's not only, it's not k plus 1 symmetric, by which I mean splits off a factor R k plus 1, no tangent cone, uh, no ball, looks epsilon close, to a cone which splits off Rk plus 1, okay? So not only is it not splitting off, I mean, it's not a tangent cone yet, but it's a definite amount away from splitting it off. So we've just made it effective. Um, it seems that Almgren may have looked at this, but uh, didn't do anything with it as far as I'm aware. Uh, certainly, he didn't prove uh, the kind of results that I s uh, that I indicated that you can prove with it. So uh, if you lo just look at the definitions, the intersection over all R is basically what I called S epsilon, maybe for K equals N minus 2 in our case, or N minus 4 in the two-sided bound case. And then the S epsilons, uh, this, this shouldn't have an epsilon, another misprint, okay? So the whole singular set uh, is, so it looks a little funny. When I say epsilon, it means as epsilon is small, I'm throwing out less and less, right? Epsilon is how much it's bounded away from splitting off Rk plus 1. So this epsilon shouldn't be there. Um, and so I'm just quantifying everything that I had with the singular set. So it's important to do this. So far, it's just a definition. Um, now, the cone splitting, this is the kind of thing that was used at the level of tangent cones in this classical blow-up analysis. So what it says is if I have a space and it's a cone in two essentially different ways, by which I mean that there's two different isometries, let's say with a priori two different cones, in the end they have to be the same. But the point is that the point which goes to the vertex is uh, different in each case, x1, x2, they're not the same point, okay? Then, in fact, it's isom x is isometric to a cone uh, which splits off uh, a line. So if it's a cone in two essentially different ways, then it's actually a cone which splits off a line. So this is, was kind of used in a different guise in this iterated blow-up uh, and it's used in the same way in the classical blow-up analysis, what I call dimension reduction or iterated blow-up. Uh, and actually, to see this, since it's a cone, it has these scalings, which are homothetes, so you can blow it up with respect to one of its vertices, say x1, and then scale it down with respect to the other one, and in the limit, that's an isometry. So that's an isometry, it's actually a translation carrying x1 to x2, but because x1 was a vertex, if I, if I do the scaling with respect to x1, it actually takes x2 into something which is again going to be a vertex. And so I really get a continuous family of isometries which are translations. You can see uh, from the distance formula they're translations, and that's basically why this principle is is true, and of course I can iterate it if I have a number of different vertices. So that's ordinary cone splitting and quantitative cone splitting. So everything is supposed to be effective. Now, in order to get effective estimates, it's an effective version of what I just said. So the points that are, so I have to have a bunch of points that are the vertices of these almost cones um, and, uh, right, so that's saying that their vertices are almost cones, the Gromov-Hausdorff equivalences are 
now the Fs of the previous one, but now they're not isometries with cones, but almost isometries in the gromov hausdorff sense. And then I take these guys, and I have R, I have k plus 1 of these approximate regularized distance functions. So since they're solutions of this, they will be harmonic functions and suitably normalized. If I did this in Euclidean space or even on a cone, this would just be a coordinate function up to normalization. Just compute x plus 1 squared minus x, uh, sorry, the distance from 1, 0 minus the distance from minus 1, 0, let's say, in the plane, right? That's, a, that's something times x, like 4x. Okay. So that's basically what I've done here. So I've taken the splitting, cone splitting of the previous transparency and made it effective, and that's one of the ingredients. And then, so what this will lead to, I haven't given the rest of the ingredients yet, but what it will lead to is then this uh, bound um, with even on, so this is just slightly more general. The other, the previous transparency a few back was k equals n minus 2, but in fact it's the same thing for actually every k with this uh, quantitative uh, stratification. And what I want to do is indicate the rest of the proof, indicate, um, and I want to try to see where this loss eta came from because that wasn't there in the first result I stated. So. Uh, it's important to try to get up to that. Okay, so we'll use the previous effective bound on the bad scales, and somehow we have to put that together into somewhere where we can use the cone splitting on the previous slide. Now, so we've, we fix uh, epsilon greater than zero, we fix one of these guys, SK, uh, epsilon, and for R we'll take uh, uh, 2 to the minus n, a very small scale. And as we know, there are a definite number of bad scales. I explained that early on, even before we tried to use it. So what it means is that there are a definite number of bad scales, all right, um, but um, for, for, in fact, for any delta as a function of epsilon, that's why I wrote epsilon here, uh, but the, so th this delta is really delta of epsilon. Um, but the particular collection will depend on the point. So I can say how many there are, a bound, upper bound, but I can't say where they occur. That could depend on the point. But uh, this is going down exponentially, whereas the number of scales is only going down like n. So this is 2 to the minus n, but the number of scales only n, in other words, logarithmically. So the number, the, the possibilities for this collection of bad scales is, is very small compared to what it would be if, they were com if there could be arbitrarily many bad scales. So what this means, so that's what I've tried to say over here, right? And so what that means is if I'm willing to give up this eta in the exponent, I can just divide into the possible collections of bad scales, look at one such collection, and uh, then add the estimates that I get because the coefficient when I add them is absorbed by the power of eta for any eta if I put a big enough constant in, in front that depends on, on eta. Uh, so now we can, we can implement a kind of cone splitting because, at least on the good scales, now we're only dealing with points that have the same good scales. So if they lie on our set and either they're, so to say, very close to one another, then we don't care, or if they're separated, then they must produce a splitting and, and so on. Okay, so the point is to get them where they, the splittings that we get from cone splittings cooperate, so to say, because at least on the same good scales, which are almost all scales. So now we want to do a covering argument, inductively covering balls on one scale by balls of the next scale. And 
on the good scales, we'll have these splittings. It will be close. The set that we're interested in will be close to a k-dimensional subspace of a cone splitting, k times the rk times the vertex. And on the bad scales, we don't really care because there are only a definite number of them, so they'll just put a constant in front of the estimate. So we're thinking of this as a kind of generalized Cantor set where, you know, uh, we go down scale by scale, and we get more and more balls, and so on. And uh, so, so that's really what this covering argument is, what I just said. So we cover by balls, scale by scale, and by the quantitative cone splitting, effectively, we're close to everywhere, that every point that we're interested in. We're only interested, basically, in balls with center on the set we're trying to cover. And there e to the 4 minus epsilon for a tube of radius r about the singular set. And then, by a very kind of soft argument, we see outside that tube, it would actually be regular. Because once uh, it splits off uh, a factor n minus 3, n minus 2, et cetera, bigger than n minus 4 by a kind of compactness argument uh, of the type pioneered by Mike Anderson, you do an argument by contradiction and you would find that uh, if it weren't true, you take the gromos hausdorff limit, you would get a cone which doesn't exist, basically. Um, there's something where you use the elliptic equation and the convergence there, but uh, let's ignore that. Um, so uh, the moral is outside of this tube, you get a definite amount of regularity. So this is a relatively soft kind of epsilon regularity theorem now that this technique uh, was implemented in a very artful way by Mike. And so now, in the remaining time, I want to look more carefully at what, what was causing this eta. So there are really two sources. One was this energy decomposition, which was a great idea, I felt, but now a little bit out of date. But at least if you're willing to accept the eta, it was very good. You can deal with just collections which have the same good and bad scales, but it led to this logarithmic factor, which was hidden by this guy here. So you at the very least are going to get a logarithmic factor, even if you're careful. If you're covering balls by balls. If you were covering cubes by cubes, you wouldn't have any overlaps. And probably you could arguably get away with that here, but you, if you tried harder. But you would still, at the very least, have a logarithmic factor in front of this. And so 
you would like, of course, to get rid of it, <clears throat> and then it would behave just like it were a smooth submanifold. But as in other borderline cases, that uh, is very uh, non-trivial to do, as it turns out. So that's the last part that I want to mention, and that's what was included in the estimate of, on, in the main theorem, which didn't have any ADA in it. So you can just think at a very formal level, what are we doing? This, this is the sum over scales of the energy differences uh, of this monotone function. So we have uh, a c c series of positive terms. We know it it's converges to some definite number. And the stuff about the tangent cones and the infinitesimal scale and so on, that's like saying we conclude from this that the nth term goes to zero. Well, it does, but that's not a very <coughs> strong consequence of it. So the stuff that we talked about so far is like saying by Markov's inequality, also known as the pigeonhole principle, if we had this, then for any x, there would only be, in fact, a definite number of things of terms, but we couldn't say which ones, which could be bigger than uh, x, namely, roughly, x should maybe have a c in front of it, c times x inverse. And of course, if you do a little bit better, because we can think of the tail of the thing, and then for small x, this ratio would actually go to zero. But it, even this, which is like what I've been talking about uh, just before, uh, is certainly weaker than saying that the series converges, right? But it's hard to, I mean, so here there's nothing to do, it converges. But to implement this in our context where we also have a series by which I mean the differences from one scale to the next of the monotone quantity, that's what's bounded in convergence. That's our series, but it's hard to implement it, to implement it for example, I use this energy decomposition, which caused me to lose something that I would prefer not to lose. So the point is we have to <coughs> take full advantage of this, and this is difficult but possible. So there's really a breakthrough in this whole theory, uh, and that was kind of the second breakthrough, which was done by Aaron and this guy, Daniele Valtorta, who been in our earlier papers. He's actually a graduate student at the time. Maybe I mentioned that Wen Shui Zhang is also a graduate student, as far as I know, or maybe by now he's not. So they had a new technology which enabled them to really use that, that you had the full series that converged, which meant you had to do something on many scales each time. The covering, the Cantor set thing did something kind of on one scale at a time. But here, you had to really use the fact that you had a series that converges. So one thing was a rectifiability theorem, which was a Reifenberg-type argument. Reifenberg means you're close to being flat on every scale. Now here, you're close in a controlled way. But uh, this theorem that they introduced uh, was actually much stronger in the sense of the conclusion was rectifiability of the singular set, and the hypothesis was much weaker than any previous one, and it was really necessary. Um, and uh, so there's a real technical tour de force that was involved here, which gave conclusions, you know, the only rectifiability theorems uh, really were like due to Leon Simon under very special hypotheses in the early in 1993 or so for which he won the Boche Prize. So this is like another, you know, at another level entirely. Um, and the, so the, the idea of a neck decomposition, which refers to this covering argument, uh, a very complicated kind of covering argument, <coughs> non obvious one could say and complicated, actually, uh, is a crucial thing. So uh, it's hard to say what this is. Something like a bubble tree, but for not non-isolated singularities. And they proved a uh, mass-bound rectifiability result for the harmonic map in minimal surface <laughs> case without the error in the exponent and et cetera. Then, um, neighbor and John adapted these ideas to the Riemannian context with a two-sided bound, 
and they approve the rectifiability of the singular set. And in fact, this volume bound on the tube, and they also prove something particular to this case, which goes beyond what would be true in the other, like harmonic map and minimal services cases. Namely, there's an a priori L2 bound on the curvature. So you would get this from our previous work with Aaron for any P less than two, but the sharp estimate was very remarkable in my opinion. We had done this with Aaron in dimension four, where you had this kind of bubble tree, like in work we had done with Mike Anderson, where we assumed an LN over two bound, which would be two in dimension four. And you kind of realize that the depth of the tree would only depend on the non-collapsing. But anyway, this generalized something we did mention four, which was the neck decomposition in that very simple case when the singular set consists of points. And this would be this L2 thing, as I just said, it's analog would be false in the other context. So this is a very strong and impressive result. And however, when you go to the, just the lower bound where you don't get this L2 bound and the singular set is co-dimension two, not four, the techniques in that paper do not work. None of the estimates are true. They require the two-sided bounds. Now the neck decomposition again plays a crucial role in our paper, but the Reisenberg argument does not work. And it has to be replaced by something else, which is more economical and uses very sharp versions, for example, of the cone splitting estimates, which can be added up and over the scales. And also a sharp version of the transformation theorem, which was one of the ingredients in the proof of the singular set at co-dimension four. So maybe then the last thing, since I use the term and it's crucial, I just give a very brief idea, incomplete of what a neck decomposition is or what's a neck. So as I said, for isolated singularities, it's something like what we have here, co-dimension four again, but it was also isolated bubble tree with isolated points as opposed to higher dimensional singular sets. So roughly speaking, and this is very rough, it's not the actual definition, neck with some parameters, it's a union of balls and on each ball, and it has some function, which is where you go down to. So that's also should be included maybe in the parameters. So it's over here. So on each ball, there's a radius where the following holds down to radius R sub X at each center. And is that you're very close on every scale down to R X of splitting off a cone, which splits off R K, but not close to splitting off R K plus one. It looks rather like what was on the previous definition of the singular set. And one crucial point for us is that harmonic functions are particularly well behaved on these neck regions, which allows you to do the sharp cone splitting, which can be added over scales. Okay, so I'll stop here. Any questions or comments? This may simply be stupid. You're starting with simplex and in some sense building out from it. You're talking about the example? I think so. In the plane of an example of simplex could be like an equilateral triangle. And one way to build out yield something called a Coke snowflake. Is there any sense in which this is like a higher dimensional analog? No, 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 because I'm building it in order not to be in that situation. It's kind of like that, but I'm building it with flatter and flatter triangles instead of in a fractal way, because I want to get a nice convex limit as opposed to a snowflake-like. 
Functions appearing in the various effective estimates. Uh, are, are those ones that could, in principle, be made explicit if one worked hard? We have this word silent of delta. Which one? Well, um, say the almost cones, but it's the volume ratio is very close to the constant level of yeah, the Usually we haven't tried to do that. So, you know, in some contexts, you might think that, you know, like where there's a gap between, let's say, an R4 between flat R, so flat R4 and the Yaguchi Hansen in the volume, I mean, you might conjecture that that's sharp. Maybe it's even known that it's sharp. Um, but in general, it's usually proved by a compactness argument and don't try to, because you don't need something that sharp. So it's definitely a question, but I'm not even sure in that case that the answer is no. Maybe someone does know it. Maybe by the classification of uh, ALE spaces, it would follow. But you know, in general, you're just interested in the existence of a constant. Ironically, in the work that I mentioned, on maps to L2, you had to keep very careful track of the estimates. Not not the explicit constant, but the form of the estimate. And it was extraordinarily painful. Um, but uh, to your specific question, mostly I don't know, and it hasn't been necessary. So could, uh, there's a lot of information that's been co covered in this talk, so it's hard to keep it straight in one's mind. So in, in, part of the discussion has to do with only a lower Ricci bound, and then, there, then at a crucial stage, you need a two-sided Ricci bound to get uh, more structure. So in terms of the, the singular sets, uh, you, you, for much of this, you need the two-sided Ricci bound in order to, to Well, no, I was just trying to give mostly an overview because at the end, you know, it's like much more technical still. But the crucial thing where the, the two-sided bound comes in in two places. Usually in the subject, including even in the co-dimension four paper, a lot of it uses just the lower bound and then the two-sided bound comes in crucially just in a couple of places. So one thing in in this various slides, sometimes I had a two and sometimes I had a four, like R squared and R to the fourth, or co-dimension two and co-dimension four. So that had to do with, for example, just at the level of house door dimension, that you was realized since the work with Toby that there was one candidate cone you had to deliver, you, you had to eliminate, right? That would get you to co-dimension three, but going from three to four was a different and much simpler topological argument. It had to do with RP three not being a boundary. So the crucial thing was get from two to three, and it was known that you just had to eliminate this candidate cone, which is the paper crop cross n minus two, right? But, of course, if you had only a lower bound, then the paper crop, of course, can occur to just round the corner. Now, if you really pretended it was a product, then it shouldn't occur, but you're not allowed to pretend that. So it took a long time. Um, figure out how to eliminate that cone if you didn't assume Kaler. If it's Kaler, it's much easier because um, you can use the first term class integrator over a slice of this thing that's near the cone and get a contradiction to uh, Stokes theorem, basically. So it's much easier if you assume it's Kaler Einstein. It's the same techniques in the paper of John Ken, just a little variation on that argument, but in the real case, it's much harder. Now, if you were just talking about Einstein, then you might say, well, there aren't many examples, but it, 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 that's why 
sides. We're talking about two sided bound on Ricci, even though the regular part need not be quite as regular. But on the other hand, it applies to many more examples. So does that answer the question? Yes. No. Okay. Very nice. Any other question? So I want to ask in this uh, neighbor's uh, history of uh, the curvature in L2. Yes. Um, is that a all dimension is in L2? Uh, that's the yeah, best. and that's one thing, that's the one part where you need an estimate that doesn't hold with the two sided bound. So this recovers the, the everything in the Paper of John and neighbor except the L2 bound, and that holds in all dimensions. So it was known to hold in dimension in four. Which, which, for me, uh, what, what is it? Well, why does uh, can you give a little bit indication why is that true? I mean, this well, seems probably so not. I mean, in dimension four, it yes. was in dimension, in dimension four, four it, it was so. quite non trivial, also, right? But from this picture, the full picture. Uh, you got a bound on the topology, and then you could use yes. Gaussman. Yeah. Now, from what I indicated about the amount of regularity you have outside the two, then that followed from what Aaron and I did, but with who, uh, you know, minus epsilon or minus eta for any eta. So that's a partial answer. Have a an estimate of the volume of the tuber on the singular set, and outside of it, the balls uh, have a definite amount of regularity, which is in including uniform bound. Uh, I mean, if you just had two sided bound and not Einstein, and still you have an L to P bound for any P, not L, you know, not, not L infinity on the second derivatives, but enough to give you. Bounded curvature with a slight loss in the exponent already from the earlier work of Aaron and myself in co dimension four. But to get the actual two is very special to the particular situation. The analogous thing doesn't hold, let's say, for the harmonic maps. Instead, you would get weak L2, um, meaning, uh, well, you know what it means as an analysis. So, but it's borderline, but it's not quite true. Uh, prior to that, you've got LP for any P less than two. So what Aaron and I did. Any other questions? Uh, let's thank the speaker for that.